Good afternoon for those of you joining. We're uh, just getting set up, having everybody come in. A couple of reminders before we begin our webinar today. Um, all participants will be muted during the course of the event. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat box or the Q&A box, which are both buttons on the control panel to uh, communicate with any of us or with the other folks that are attending. Um, we also are recording this session so that it'll be available for others uh, to view in the future. And uh, we're so glad you're here with us this afternoon. So we'll give a couple more seconds. <clears throat> All right, it looks like our numbers have stopped racing up as we open the, the room, so we're gonna get started. All right, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining the Sacramento State Alumni Association and Hornet Athletics for Meet the Coaches, the spring edition. Uh, we're very excited to have you here today uh, to learn more about these wonderful sports and their coaches, and uh, as well as all of athletics. I wanna thank Cheryl Boyce, who's been uh, a huge help in getting these scheduled. Thank you, Cheryl. Do you want to say a couple words as we get started? Just excited to see everybody again. It's great to see everyone. Thank you. All right, so if there are no other questions, we'll just jump right in and uh, get going and we'll share more information towards the end of the program on ways that you can get involved. Um, I want to start with having everybody introduce themselves if you could tell us your name, your sport, and how long you've been at Sac State. Uh, let's start with Coach Kurtz. Hi, my name is Kevin Kurtz, and I've uh, been at Sac State. Uh, this is men's tennis, and I've been at Sac State for uh, 16 years. Thank you. Coach Perez. I'm Lori Perez, head softball coach. I have been with the university since the fall of 98 and became an assistant coach in the fall of 2004. So this is oh. a few years, 22 going on now, I think. Wonderful. Coach Hubs. Hi, I'm Cami Hubs. I'm the head women's tennis coach uh, and I am just now starting my fourth year. Ooh, wonderful. And we have Coach Jackson sitting in for Coach Volta today who is unfortunately unavailable. So Coach Jackson. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Ed Jackson. I work with the uh, beach volleyball team. Um, I'm the co-head beach coach. Ruben and I co-head the team together. And uh, I'm going into my sixth season with the program. Thank you for joining us. Coach Roberts. Hi, I'm Jolie Roberts. I'm the dance team director and coach. And I have been on campus since 99, getting my when I got my undergrad degree. Uh, but I started coaching in 03. So 17 seasons or so. Wow, fantastic. Coach Connors. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Connors, women's rowing coach. Uh, I have been, this is my 19th year, so I've been here 18 years, almost exactly this month. Great, thank you. And Coach Christensen. Hi, I'm Reggie. I've uh, been here, uh, just finished up 12 years, 10 years as a head coach, and uh, excited to be on. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not smart enough to figure out how to put that backdrop on, but uh, my backdrop is uh, a little bit different today. Sorry about that. That's all right. We're just happy to have you here. You've got baseball represented on your shirt, so I don't think we'll uh, forget what sport you're representing. And uh, we got a lot of years of history here in the room today. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, let's kick it off with just a softball question, pun intended, Lori. Um, what, if any, nicknames do your players have for you? And let's start with softball. Lori. Well, my current players, I don't think they have any particular nicknames that they say in maybe in front of me. They usually just call me Coach or Coach Perez. But many of our alumni and my former teammates when I played here, they, uh, they call me Mikey. So that's a nickname very well known within our, our older, our older uh, players and, and former players here. I'm guessing there's a story there somewhere. My 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 previous last name uh, was Mikesner. So when I played here, um, my my maiden name is Lori Mikesner. And so from that, um, a former coach, uh, first time assistant Jenny Schultz, who was a player here and coached my freshman year, she's the one that started calling me that. And then it just kept going. So as those things do. Yep. How about you, Cami? I'm the boring one. They just call me coach. I'm sure they have some stuff that they call me, not to my face, but yeah, it, it's coach. 
All right. How about you, Kevin? Uh, yeah, again, same thing. Most of them call me coach. Um, but when I was in college, they called me K-Dog um, on my <laughs> team because I had two uh, Siberian Huskies. And they howled a lot. And um, I don't know how it started, but it was. <laughs> well, maybe your players should bring that back after this. Well, we could do it if you guys want. Sounds good. <laughs> Ed, how about you? Uh, the players just call me Ed. Uh, good old fashioned, you know, just very simple. Um, they will change kind of the, the way they say it. Uh, like if I walk into the gym, everybody will kind of do a big, Ed. So that's pretty much about it, though. <laughs> All right. How about you, Reggie? You know, they just, uh, most of them just call me Reg or Reggie. Um, you know, I think some of the freshmen will, will go coach first, but, you know, for whatever reason, for the longest time, I've just allowed our guys to call me by my first name. Um, I think it might be a little bit different in the sport of baseball, but um, not too many guys call me coach. All right. How about you, Mike? Uh, pretty much just Mike or Coach Mike. More uh, used to be almost all Mike in the past, and the last few years, you know, they uh, most of them say Coach Mike or Coach. So, <laughs> not, I didn't, you know, I didn't suggest one way or the other. I always, I always just told them like, just call me Mike. It's fine. All right, and Jolie, uh, the seasoned veterans call me Joel's. Uh, but uh, a lot of the rookies will call me coach yeah. or by my first name. Start out with the respect of coach and then they get familiar and right. go yeah. to the first name. Awesome. How about uh, we shift over to workout music? And I'm guessing with dance, you have naturally some music favorites that come to mind. So we'll let you start that off okay. while everyone else scrambles for what is their favorite workout music. I was hoping I'd get that question. Uh, anything Lady Gaga. <laughs> That sounds, that sounds energetic and fun. How about you, Ed? Uh, I like country music, so uh, anything that's kind of, you know, party country, anything like that uh, gets me kind of going. So we usually play that, you know, when we're setting up the courts and things like that, pre, you know, pre-match and things like that. All right. Mike, how about you? Any workout music? Uh, I like a lot of different kinds of music, but... Uh... Alternative rock probably um, is my favorite, and then um, or old classic rock like old ACDC or something like that. <laughs> nice, that'll get it going. Yeah, Lori, how about your team? You know, um, for me, I, I like a lot of different things. I'd say the most popular around, around the team is probably you know '90s R&B, hip hop, or or something a little more pop, maybe early 2000s. Um, when we're working out, you know, I'll usually, if I'm in the bullpen or something or, or who I'm around, I might put on what I know that player specifically likes um, just to kind of give them a little bit more vibe in their workout. But we, we, we mix it around a little bit. They're like their very own Pandora, mixing it up to what they like. That's awesome. Yep, yep. Um, let's shift over to tennis. Uh, let's how, how about men's tennis? I think for, uh, for workout music for our team, uh, I usually let the players kind of pick our playlist and they really have a lot of fun putting it together. Um, we throw the speaker up and um, a lot of times when we're tired, it gives us lots of energy and stuff. Uh, me personally, I like a whole bunch of different kind of music. Um, when I'm working out, I like Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, really pump me up. So, but there's uh, you know, <laughs> lots of different ones. So no, you can never lose with that. Uh, Cammie, how about women's tennis? Uh, we're we're a lot the same as men's tennis. Uh, our team, you can see our team dancing all around when we have our music on. It's it's just fun, upbeat type music. Um, we have a lot of international students, so we get a good mix of everything. Um, I've learned a lot over the past uh, few years, just some new music and stuff. So in my workouts, I've been doing a lot of spin workouts lately. So I've been kind of on the EDM scene where it's like very loud and it gets you going. It also helps fill the room when it's empty because you're the only one working out, which is, very true. <laughs> there's some perks to that. Uh, how about men's baseball, dancing on the diamond? Yeah, I guess for me when I work out, it's, uh, I actually don't like to listen to music when I work out. I just kind of like to 
um, grind through it and think about different, you know, daydream about our team playing in Omaha someday. Um, well, I do listen to music when I mow the outfield grass with our mower. And uh, I, I kind of go back and forth bet between like uh, uh, Spotify, you know, Taylor Swift uh, playlists. Uh, well, I'm not embarrassed to, to say that. I love t some T-Swift. And then uh, uh, some Gary Allen, uh, Tim McGraw, um, Eric Church. Uh, so just kind of go back and forth between that, th those two. And then uh, our guys like to listen to a lot of different th stuff for their playlist uh, for batting practice. They, you know, I let them each pick two songs and that thing just kind of plays through during batting practice. Um, they'd like to listen to less country uh, during <laughs> batting practice than I would, but uh, we kind of go back and forth there. Well, I bet the country goes well with the crack of the bat as they're hitting those balls. <laughs> All right. Um, let's take from your favorite music, let's move on to uh, superpower. So if you had any superpower in the world, what would it be? Let's start with Kevin. Uh, that's a good one. Um, mine would be mind reading. Uh, so I could read what the other coaches are thinking about our players and how to beat them. And then also their players, I can mind read and find out um, what they're thinking about so that we could kind of counteract that. That'd That's be my great. Yeah. That'd be great. Reggie, how about you? I was going to say the same thing. You kind of <laughs> stole that one, Kevin. I'd like to know uh, what our players think sometimes when we're coaching them. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure they'd like to know what we think. So I'm going to go with Kevin's answer. That's a good one, Kevin. A good one, Mind Reggie. reading's always a winner. Cammie. Uh, I'd, I'd like to teleport anywhere. Um, so some teleportation, uh, especially right now, because I have my team – kind of all over the world. So it'd be nice to be able to get to them each uh, every, every day, see everyone. I can understand that. Jolie, how about you? Uh, I think I'd be like the invisible woman. So I, so I could kind of figure out the he said, she said thing, you know, and, and uh, along with the transporting myself there. So I can get the real version of what happened instead of this person and that person. So. Be the ultimate eavesdropper would be kind of cool, but it'd probably add to my stress level as well. So it'd be a lot more truth in your world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lori, how about you? Um, I'd say for me, I mean, it's along the, the teleporting. I, I wish I could fly. Um, I am, I go a mile a minute all day long and try to do too many things in, in one day. So, you know, to be able to get places faster would be phenomenal. I, I'd probably try to fit more in, but maybe flying would let me get there a little sooner so I could enjoy and be present and not feel like I'm running around. So that, that would be, that would be the ultimate for me. Yeah, soaring, flying, that would be awesome. Yeah. Mike, how about you? I'm the same as Laura, ability to fly. I, I hate traffic, so there'd be one way to circumvent that. And I think, you know, you get to have some great views while you're getting to where you want to go. Yep. Oh, so true. Ed. I think if I could uh, be like the Flash and just be able to just, you know, run somewhere as fast as humanly possible or just really fast get from one place to the other quickly, um, I think that would be a, you know, a great superhero power to have. So true. You could win all the ultra marathons if you were the Flash. Um, Indeed. <laughs> so how about we're all in this quarantine self-isolation time. How about your favorite binge watch over the last few months? Um, Ed, let's start with you since your mic's still on. I actually just uh, finished watching uh, the latest episode of Yellowstone. So that's kind of the big, uh, that's our, that's my current binge watch is uh, the Yellowstone on Paramount Network. That was a favorite among the fall sport coaches, I recall that. Uh, mm -hmm. Lori, how about you? Yeah, this was a hard one. I was trying to think of, of what, I mean, there's been a few things and it's been a few months. <laughs> um, okay. Probably the favorite one, and I haven't been able to see Yellowstone, but I, I want to see that one. Um, but probably my favorite one, it was on Hulu, uh, Mrs. America. It was a story about uh, Equal Rights Act and the acting was phenomenal and the women in it are just great. So that one was probably my favorite so far since uh, the quarantine life. That sounds great. I haven't seen that. Kevin, how about you? Well, um, 
I've been watching a couple of them. Yellowstone was one of my big ones too. Uh, this last couple of weeks have been uh, in the dark. It's on Netflix and that's, uh, that's a great one. My daughter was just telling me about that one. I have to check it out. Uh, Reggie, how about you? Yellowstone uh, was really good as well, but Little Fires Everywhere mm -hmm. uh, was something we really liked. Reese Witherspoon and uh, she was in it. She was really, really good. Uh, it was really good. Right. How about you, Mike? Uh, I've been kind of a big MSNBC junkie um, uh, lately. And um, my favorite uh, anchors are uh, Brian Williams, but um, also Joy Reid, uh, which her show's on right now, by the way, and um, Rachel Maydew. Uh, but they're all really great. Some really great um, guests and reporting. It's awesome. Thanks. Cammy, um, I'm I'm more of a big reader than anything, so I've been I've been reading a lot more um, than binge watching TV. But when I need to go, I just watch something usually that I've seen before um, that I can actually binge. Uh, so I've been doing Friends over again, The Office over again, and just just going and going and going. And those are classics. I mean, my kids watch those too, nonstop. Uh, Jolie. Well, like Cammie, I revisited The Office again. Uh, been going to the Dunder Mifflin Paper Company daily basis. But um, so uh, I will admit fully here, full disclosure, I got into The Tiger King, <laughs> which was a complete train wreck from the minute you start watching it. You just have to go full blast. So, um, but then I feel like I've progressed a little bit and I'm kind of into, I'm not kind of into, I am, I like masterpiece theater. So oh. mystery, um, anything like that's period based historically, you know, those kind of things. Cause it, it um, especially with World War II and whatnot, what we're facing today, it gives me a little more perspective of what we do have available to us, you know, versus a lot of our family members back then, so. Yeah, some educational stuff and some really trashy stuff at the same time, so. Well, we appreciate your honesty because you know, <laughs> many of us had that initial quarantine Tiger King mm -hmm. moment, so. You all saw it, I know you did. Yes. <laughs> um, what one quick piece of advice would you give your younger self? Let's start with Lori. Oh, um, for my younger self, it would probably to be to slow down and enjoy a little bit more. I, I was always in a big hurry to get to the next thing or big hurry to get to the next phase of life. And instead of just being in the moment and enjoying being young and, and being in the place wherever I was at that time. So if there was anything, and, and I see our players do that too, there's just that anxiousness to want to get to the next phase or the next drill or the next this or that. And if, if I could have just told myself to slow down and enjoy every day instead of trying to rush um, forward too fast, that, that, would be, that would be the number one thing. Such great advice. Thanks. Jolie, how about you? Uh, I would say for me um, to just go for it. I let fear and insecurities hold me back because of anxiety and, and what I was facing growing up. And so I, I missed out on things that I think I could have excelled um, at. So probably just to go for it. And if you fail, you fail, you know? Um, realizing that I wish I would have taken some more risks when I was 18 and 19. Um, yeah. It's never too late to just go for it. Well, that's actually happening currently. So let, you know. Yeah, fantastic. Mike, what would your advice to yourself be? Um, control the controllable and probably uh, deal with the uncontrollable um, as best you can. Um, that's just to focus on the things you can't control and don't uh, stress or um, be too anxious about what you cannot. How very relevant for this time period we're in. Reggie. Oh, it's a very good question. I, I think for me, um, not, not trying to be everything to everybody, not trying to please um, everybody in terms of 
you know, you have a program, 35 players, and you're trying to make every one of their parents happy and the players happy. And um, I just tried to early on tried to um, be perfect to everybody. And that's just impossible. And it kind of can lead you down the wrong road. That is a good lesson. We all learn that in life, that is impossible. Ed, how about you? I think just, uh, you know, just trying to stay present and, you know, in, in daily life and things like that. Um, it's really easy to kind of think about the should have, could have, would have, or the future and, and think about, you know, what could happen down the road. And that could, that could be in anything, including competition and stuff like that. So I think it's just, I think that was um, some good advice I got was just the importance of just staying present in the moment so that you can execute what you need to execute. Great advice. Cami. Um, for me, I think it's just trust the process. Um, if I would have been told that I, I maybe wouldn't be like Lori said, just trying to get everything done uh, all, all at once and, and kind of getting ahead of myself. So trusting the process going day by day and, and really working for what you want. I know it's a struggle that we all continue to face in the many things. Trust the process. I like that. Kevin. I think for, for me, if I was to go back in time and tell myself some things, um, just to be go after what I'm passionate about, um, never quit no matter what, and kind of map out a whole bunch of different ways to get to to get those outcomes that I'm looking to get, and um, just uh, just daily kind of working on it. And um, I think um, those things would have helped me out a lot. All great advice. Thank you guys for sharing. Let's transition a little bit to your sport and getting to know you in that realm. Um, when start with what inspired you to become a coach? Let's start with uh, baseball, Reggie. I think that, you know, early on in my, uh, at the end of my playing career, I think I had some regrets as to uh, what I would have done different as a player. Um, and I think it really just propelled me to, to chase, uh, pursue, um, coaching as a profession to, to help a group of kids or each year chase their dream and, and, and be someone that can be um, an advocate, advocate for them, but at the same time challenge them in a way. Uh, I think at the, at the end for me I, as a player, I, I just wish looking back um, that I would have asked more questions of my coaches and, and challenged myself a little bit more. So uh, it took me an extra year to graduate college. So it was a natural progression to become like an undergraduate coach. And I just fell in love with the planning and the recruiting and the daily practice part of it. So uh, I think that's what led me down that road. I, I really have, have never done anything else. So I um, feel very blessed to, to be where I'm at. That's awesome. Cami, what inspired you? Um, I, like Reggie, have never done anything else. Uh, right out of school, I became um, an assistant coach right away. I had known it was something I wanted to do my whole life. My dad actually coached um, collegiate tennis when I was born until about eight years old, and then he transitioned into another tennis role. So it's it's been a part of my life um, since I can remember, and I fell in love with it from an early age. And Getting the opportunities that I did just made me love it even more. That's great to know what you want to be at uh, such a young age. That's awesome. Uh, Kevin, how about you? I think kind of started really young for me too. Um, eighth grade um, transition from soccer to tennis because we moved um, from Oregon to Colorado and the soccer team was great, but it just didn't have the same vibe. So just started getting into tennis. My friends and I played a lot. And my friends that didn't play, um, I taught them how to play and, Pretty soon, the next year, we all made the tennis team, and um, by my senior year, the team won the state title, which was really cool. And um, right, right then, there, I knew I wanted to coach, coach tennis in some form. And then I went to tennis teachers college. And then I went and played college tennis, and then um, then it was kind of uh, after that, just going from high school into different different aspect coaching to junior college and then to D1 so that's kind of what how it kind of got going so well it sounds like you were a natural teaching at such a young age even oh it was just fun you know getting out there with your buddies you know, it's 
who do you want to play with? You know, people you don't know or your friends. So it's really great. Lori, how about you with softball? You know, growing up, probably like a lot of people, my, you know, career goals changed a million times. I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and at that time, when I was younger, being a coach wasn't, you know, in the collegiate sense where you could make a career and a life out of it wasn't in even the possibility, you know, um, and the opportunities were just coming about when I, you know, even got into college and, and just seeing it all unfold and, and really transitioned into coaching based off of trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life after I got done playing ball. And it was suggested to me to try out coaching just because that was what I had done. You know, my dad was a coach, my brothers, I have two older brothers, they played ball and I grew up on the field. I, I don't know what it's like not to have a, a season, <laughs> you know, whether I'm sitting in the stands watching my brothers or, or playing myself or, or now coaching. So it was a natural transition once I, you know, I called our former head coach, Kathy Strahan and asked if any local jobs were in the area and, and got a great opportunity to work at a local high school at a college, um, actually kind of a random backstory, Brian Katz, our men's basketball coach, yeah. him and I got our starts at the same school, same high school here, same athletic director hired us a few years apart. Um, he started there obviously before I did, um, but uh, we, we got our starts at the same place at Center High School um, and it was a great transition and, and just loved it. And then, you know, had the opportunity to come back to SAC to coach and, and it's, it's just something that as I've done it and as I've been a part of it, it just, it's, it's such a natural transition that I, you know, it's, it's amazing to think that I, I didn't even know that this could be a possibility as a young girl and then be able to do it now. It's, it's, you know, it, it feel very fortunate. So it, it's been a weird road in terms of, I, I, I never had it in the, in the realm and then it, it, uh, it kind of developed and uh, it's really stuck now. Well, we're glad you found that path. Thanks. Ed, how about you with volleyball? Um, well, I actually got started with volleyball and got inspired. Um, I'm a community college transfer uh, success story. So I attended Grossmont College down in San Diego before I finished at Sacramento State. And my, I was playing on the men's volleyball team there. And my coach actually said, the best way to get better at volleyball is to coach the sport. And you know, if you're teaching something, you're really learning how to get better at it. So that kind of inspired me to go out and get my first uh, coaching job. It was a junior varsity boys volleyball uh, job at a local high school near uh, Grossmont. And so that's what kind of got me going and got me involved in coaching the sport. Wonderful. How about you, Mike, with rowing? Um, I got involved uh, right after I, I rode at Santa Clara and um, one of my friends on the team became the head men's coach. So um, I, I just kind of got started helping him out basically. And I wanted to help out the team and get back to the, to the program in some way and found out it was something I really enjoyed and had a knack for. But um, I, I spent many years as a, as a coach, um, I, it's kind of a dual career. I, I always worked full time and coached part time, and um, especially when I lived in uh, the Bay Area, and uh, and that it was kind of cool because I I had my sort of business job, and then I I had my coaching thing, and you know they were very different. So it was uh, wasn't until I came here that I was actually full time coach. So it was a long, slow <laughs> process towards this career, but um, I've been involved in the sport for a long time. Well, it sounds like you got to experience many things before dedicated coaching. That's awesome. Yeah. Or before solo coaching, I don't know what the right term is there, but uh, Jolie, how about you? What inspired you? You're muted. Yep. Sorry about that. I don't remember ever doing anything else. I didn't, I didn't set out to be a collegiate dance coach, actually. I was always in the private sector and dance studios. I started teaching at 15 and a half, and... Um, but before that, growing up in my neighborhood with a bunch of local kids around, I was directing, you know, little shows for Fourth of July or puppet shows or summer things. So um, I knew I wanted to go into stay with dance in some format, but um, I didn't 
set out to come to Sac State as the dance coach. I had a really good friend that was um, hired for the position. We met in the dance program at Sac State in the dance and theater department, and she ended up uh, having to go out on a full year of medical leave, and she, she uh, said, oh, it's going to be so easy. You'll be fine. And, um, yeah, it wasn't those first couple of years, but um, it was completely a different culture than the studio world. And, um, but I, that was back in 2003. And so I haven't looked back since. So um, again, I just, I, I don't feel like I was meant to do anything else. Um, and unfortunately my position is, is part-time, I want to say unfortunately, but it, it's a little bit different than some of the um, other coaches here. So I work full-time in the art department um, as an ASC too. And so, um, those two different worlds are, you know, um, different and yet there are similarities. So I'm, I'm so grateful that we do still have a program for dance that we can, um, you know, reach out to students that, um, uh, are not just based in the dance department at Sac State, but they want maybe a different style of dance, which I think that we provide on the sidelines. So, yeah. Well, that's great. So I was going to ask many of you, or all of you, what brought you to Sac State, but some of you answered that. So I'm going to morph that in with our following question, which is, what is your favorite memory or thing about Sac State? So if you want to share how you got to Sac State, if you haven't already, and then your favorite thing or memory about Sac State. And um, let's start with Cami. I came to Sac State uh, kind of on a whim. I was uh, not really in search of, of a head coaching position yet, uh, but I just I decided to go for it and uh, I'm really happy that I did. I think uh, it's been one of the greatest experiences of my life and I absolutely love it here. Um, I love the people at Sac State. I'd say that's one of the, my favorite things about Sac State uh, is just the people, the traditions that we have. Uh, my absolute favorite thing is President Nelson going around yelling stingers up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I love, love everything about it. I don't think I'd change a thing. We do have a great Hornet family. Um, Ed, how about you? Sorry about that. Um, um, my, one of my favorite memories are memories here is really just um, all the relationships that I've developed over the years. Um, I'm still in contact with a lot of my former teammates uh, that I played with as a student, as a student athlete here. Um, and, uh, and then I've made a lot of, a lot of uh, great, developed some really great friendships here with the coaching staff and, 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 the, and the athletic staff here, as well as I also uh, work in the uh, kinesiology department. So, um, it really is. It's, you know, Sacramento State is a, is a great place, a great family. Kevin, how about you? Yeah, um, I think I started here 16 years ago as the volunteer coach. Uh, that next season, the assistant left, and I was up and running, so it was good. Um, and then um, I had a lot of fun assistant coaching slash head coaching um, memories, but I think my ultimate favorite one is when um, there was a, a tournament at Stanford. Um, it was called the ITA uh, National Qualifier. Um, we happened to win that one, um, and when the coach from uh, Stanford handed me the, the trophy and handed our, our player, Kirill Harbert, to the player, um, the trophy he said, looks like no one from your school's ever been on this trophy before. Oh. That was really, really cool. That has got to be a proud moment. Yeah, that was a fun one. That was a fun one. So, uh, that, was the, that was my most um, exciting experience here. So that was great. That's awesome. Reggie, what is your uh, path to Sac State and your favorite memory? Uh, so my path to Sac State really comes through, you know, one person, and that's uh, Coach John Smith. Uh, I worked at the University of Kansas for two years, and – Rich Price is the coach of Kansas, and he and, and Coach, coach Smith are really, really good friends. So that's how I got to know Coach Smith way back when. And I had an opportunity coming from South Dakota State to come back to California um, to work for Coach Smith. And it was, uh, you know, it was something we couldn't, couldn't turn down as a family. My wife and I had just had our second son. And uh, just baseball in South Dakota, although 
we loved our time in South Dakota. The people were awesome, but uh, playing 28 home games in a four-year period is not <laughs> not ideal. So uh, coming to Sac State was awesome. It, it was it was uh, a lot of fun to to get to uh, take the reins when Coach Smith decided to retire. And uh, I think my we've had some really good moments um, in those 10 years, but I think my most memorable moment uh, is in 2019 when we won six straight games to to win the WAC. And, and go on and play uh, in the regional at Stanford. So those were that was a week that I'll never forget. It was exciting. I remember I was just starting to use Twitter at that time and was pushing out tweets about your success. So great memories. Um, Coach Connors, how about you? Um, my path here was kind of like, uh, actually, I was competing again. Um, it's kind of in between coaching things and uh, through that, I met uh, uh, competitors from all over. The, the rowing community is pretty tight, so it was like um, I was doing a bunch of racing, and I just met a lot of great people, and uh, some of the guys I met were from here, Sacramento, and invited me up for some training and uh, from the Bay Area, and, and then eventually they were all, I mean, some of them were Davis guys, you know, so it's like they were all, um, hey, we're going to get you up here to coach at Davis one of these days and I just laughed and about a year later I was coaching the UC Davis men so um and then from there um the, the opportunity to, to come to Sac State sort of became available and I was already in the area and everything so it was a really great opportunity um but um my favorite memories actually happened in my uh, second year I guess it was at 04 we went to uh, this big regatta called Dad Bell. It was before we were in a conference, so it was kind of our our, our big year-end regatta type thing. It was a championship race. It was one of the biggest collegiate regattas in the U.S., and so it was kind of a big deal, and um, I had only been there a couple of years, and the year before, I inherited like 10 varsity rowers, so we had to really build the thing pretty quickly, and um, and uh, it's, it's and, then we in, and then again in 2010, just because there were such different circumstances, but the same race. And it's a cool race because it's very traditional and it's got the big grandstand at the end. You know, rowing's weird. It's like there's <laughs> – sometimes there's not hardly anybody there, but this thing's like uh, – they shut down the city for it and the Schuylkill, and um, it's a big deal. And um, uh, it's it's the uh, the award ceremonies. Is, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty cool experience, so to – to stand there on the dock and, and give out the medals to the rowers in the boat and all that kind of stuff. And um, the second time we won it, um, we actually got a picture with Mayor Nutter at the time, who's the, the mayor of, uh, of Philly. Um, and so, um, you know, it was, uh, that's, that race is where it's strange too, because it's, it's the only race course I've ever been on. That's, <laughs> that's <it's> crooked. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a turn in it and uh, at first I thought it was the strangest thing it's so you, you it's kind of like a track race you start staggered which is really weird for rowing so that made it really unique but um the, the whole experience was so great and, and winning it was um was a really kind of a highlight you know for us well, that sounds awesome and I'm glad you came across the causeway to Sac State uh <laughs> Jolie how about you there's many moments and uh, favorite moments, I would say, but um, the relationships that I have been able to um, form with with dancers, faculty and staff. Um, Reggie, I love that you mentioned South Dakota because that is literally my second home. My family lives in Rapid City. So um, yeah, and that was a that was one of my special moments coming to Sac State as our former athletic director, Terry Wanless. Um, First time I met him, I noticed that he had a Black Hills gold ring on and I, we started talking right then and it turned out he, he had a relative who started a really remote town that my great grandparents spent for, in for 50 years. So that right there just kind of sealed the deal for me um, being in the athletic department and just getting to know everybody at games and um, has been again the relationships and then in 2005 we decided to compete one year and uh we ended up winning a, a championship a national title in hip-hop which was really nice it put sac state on on the map which was always a good thing so yeah and the national title that's awesome beautiful so yeah nice 
And Lori, how about you with softball? You know, for me, it goes back to, um, you know, our former head coach, uh, Kathy Strahan. You know, she recruited me to come play ball here. And uh, I had a few schools looking at me. And, and when I came on campus, I just remember walking on and just feeling so at home. Um, I still get that feeling now. Uh, that's been one of the hard parts about working from home is just missing out on the beauty of, of what campus life. I've been around the country and been around California, seen a lot of universities and, and ours is just so beautiful. And the leaves, even though sometimes having to pick them up in our bullpen is a little bit of a nuisance, but it, it's a good problem. Um, so she recruited me to come here to play ball for her and for our program. And, um, you know, and then same thing when I graduated, I, I coached locally for two years and a job opportunity came about in uh, at UOP. So I called Coach Strahan again to get a letter of recommendation. And that's when I found out that we had an opening here. So I applied for both and um, obviously took the job here because this is where I wanted to be. And have just, like I said, the, the campus is, is my, I just love it. I love walking around. I love seeing everything. Those are those moments where I, I will slow down or, you know, dodge out of the way for a squirrel or something. Um, and many of you probably remember years ago, we used to have a lot of roosters and things on campus that were, they were so loud, you'd be in class and they would disrupt the teachers or the professors. Uh, probably one of my favorite memories, there's a handful of them, but as a player, and I don't, I don't really mention it too much and it just popped in my head, you know, probably my favorite memory of a player as a player is when we beat the number one team in the country at that time was UCLA and it was incredible. We had no business beating them, but we put together a phenomenal game. And I remember making the last three outs at third base in the game and just being like, wow, you know, and we were, we were elated. And um, it, was a, it was a great experience um, to, to be able to say you beat the number one team in the country. If, if you, you can't be the number one, you wanna beat the number one. And um, that was a, a really a great experience that we took forward with us and then coaching, I just, there's too many to even, even nail down one at this point. I can imagine what a high that must have been to beat UCLA. That's awesome. Yeah. I am going to transition for a moment to Cheryl and let her uh, cover anything that's in the Q&A so we don't run out of time for that. Uh, so Cheryl, take it away. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, there's only a couple of questions. And uh, the first one is, since you're a coaches of the spring sports, you have the longest to prepare for your upcoming sports seasons. What is the toughest, what are the toughest issues you have to face right now in preparation? And let's go with Ed first. I think for us is um, it's just getting all of our protocols in place for us to be able to start training again. So that's kind of what we're working on right now. Uh, we've put together a, kind of a plan of how we're, how we'd like to start training, uh, getting out and with school starting on Monday uh, for our student athletes. So that's kind of the big focus. Um, we have to basically put together a plan of how we're going to train, when, what times, how many people at a time, uh, we have to really look at our groupings of players um, to try and minimize, um, you know, just having a lot of people in one place at one time and, and just trying to follow uh, the guidelines that are set forth by the state when it comes to uh, COVID-19. So uh, that's probably the biggest issue we have right now, but um, we're really excited. We're anxious to get back at it. And I know our athletes are um, as well as they are getting ready to start uh, classes on Monday. Great. Um, anybody have anything different to add to that that I'd like to comment on or share, Lori? I was, yeah, for me, I was just gonna say outside of what Ed brought up, obviously that that I think is the number one challenge for, for many of us, but it's just the fact that you can't get to, you know, it's harder to get together as a group in person. We can do our Zoom calls and we're, we're trying to be, as coaches, we're trying to be as creative as possible, um, you know, but we got seven new players and you want them to get to know each other and build that chemistry. So that, that's a bit of a challenge, you know, and just trying to figure out and hopefully we can continue to move forward with uh, having our cases lower and, and have a little bit more, you know, 
openness, but um, right now the health and safety is, is the number one. I would agree with that as well, Lori. I think in our situation, it's unique versus somebody that has a lecture class. Uh, we do hands-on training, and so it's really difficult to look at a set of, of dance choreography and routines and not be able to visually show that because we're all different learners and some can learn visually really quickly or audibly or all together. And so that has been my biggest challenge is not being in the classroom and feeling that energy and thriving off that learning experience for everybody. And then not knowing if tomorrow the ban is gonna be lifted and we're gonna be at games, you know? So that's, that's, that's hard and frustrating, but at the same time, we're also in a position where we, um, We've never faced these situations before, so I'm thankful that um, that everybody is adjusting accordingly and being as patient as possible. But it's hard, yeah. And in follow up to that question, um, is if it would be helpful to ask a question of your coaches, how would you foster that? Oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, it appears that you, no, 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 I'm just reading through the question that we just had. Um, would you foster that practice? I'm not sure that there, it's a gentleman asking, what are the biggest needs of your programs um, currently? And then, I don't know if this is a follow-up question or not. I'll, I'll try and figure this out. So what are the biggest needs of your programs? And let's start with Kevin. You know, you, you know for our program, uh, um, due to you know, the conference schedule coming up in the spring, um, the games are gonna be, we had to really reduce our conference travel, but we lucked out, we have 18 home matches and um, I think some needs for our players. I'd like to get them a meal before uh, or snack before the matches and then some kind of dinner thing afterwards, um, feed our players more. We said we have so many matches at home. And I think um, that don't really help us with bonding as a team, as far as, um, again, we have a whole bunch of new players also on our team. So it'd be a great way to, you know, sit around and, and um, kind of hang out after the matches and, and kind of enjoy uh, the team camaraderie and things like that. So that would help us out a lot. People could help. Right. Reggie? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, it's really hard for me to, to sit in front of people and, and ask for money right now with, with what's gone on. There's just so many people have been affected in so many different ways. And now you have these fires really in our own backyard that are affecting so many people as well. Um, so, you know, for us, it's just, you know, when we do get a chance to get back on the field and, and play games, it, you know, the hope would be that we could get as many people out there to support our players in person. Um, so that's what I would ask for right now um, It's just, and who knows when, when that's going to be or what that's going to look like. Um, but the hope would be when we get a chance to play again that we could fill those seats, support our guys. Ed? Yeah, um, for, for us in beach volleyball, uh, you know, we've put together our, our schedule. We had our schedule for 2021. Uh, it's set and done, but with the fall sports postponing to the spring that creates um, that could create a lot of changes with scheduling. So um, I think that that's kind of something, um, you know, that we'd like to get settled is just finding out, you know, what's the plan for the spring. And I know that there's a lot that goes into it, so I'm sure it's going to take some time, but as far as uh, are the NCAA going to, you know, when, when are the NCAA planning on hosting the championships? Cause that, kind of dictates when conference schedules will be going. And for us in beach volleyball, uh, we also have indoor players that do both. They have dual sport athletes. So um, we're, we're in a, a situation where we just kind of need to find out, are we going to have an overlapping season? Because we typically don't with our indoor season being in the fall and our beach volleyball season in the spring. So our crossover athletes don't overlap, but with this situation going on right now with the postponement, we have the potential of having an overlapping season and that can be a challenge. So that's kind of about it. Mike, what are the needs for your program currently? Well, uh, besides of 
a uh, vaccine. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, short term, um, I think for everybody, um, there's uh, a lot of issues um, in terms of how to do this, all our sports safely uh, with, you know, with COVID and, and there's expenses related to that. It's testing, of course. Um, I'd like to see, <laughs> I'd like to see our, our country put more effort into rapid testing personally. Um, I think it'd be a tremendous benefit to, to everybody, whether they want to go to school or work or play a sport or go to a game, you know, and, um, uh, uh, you know, hopefully there's some, some movement there. Um, uh, long-term, uh, I was hoping to buy a boat this year, but we had to put that on hold. So our, our equipment's very expensive. It's, uh, a, a new eight these days is, uh, about $60,000. So it's, um, the nice thing about the, the, the modern equipment is, is it does last a long time, but, um, you know, so, so hopefully we can kind of get back to that, um, you know, pretty soon, but, um, you know, we, we had to kind of pinch our pennies this year and, you know, you know, we'll have to continue to watch that. So, um, that would be kind of more of a, something we want to do down the road, hopefully. Great. Lori, any additions to that or? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, you, you know, and we were in the same boat, you know, with the challenges, you know, the, you can't, fundraise, you can't do some of the things you're used to doing in terms of um, servicing your program. So, and you know, we, we are looking into things and, and if Coach Rios, our associate head coach was on this, she'd probably rattle off a list. Um, she's our shopper in the group. Um, but, you know, we, speakers for the, you know, the scoreboard and, and just little things like that. Obviously, you know, Reggie and I've talked a lot about, you know, um, not a lot, but a handful of times about, you know, doing a, a big clubhouse type of thing for, um, you know, our sports, because we're, we're, you know, a little bit away from our particular locker room. Um, so stuff like that, just little wish list things. But right now, to be honest, it's, it's so much about staying healthy, servicing the players that we're, we're keeping those things on our, our wish list. But we're going to pay attention to those things that are priorities first, um, like it on the field and, and hopefully training, getting prepared for a season and, and hopefully having some fans in the stands, not only to celebrate our girls, but also just to celebrate the sport. And, and you know, I think people miss being, you know, present and it's great to be able to watch it on TV right now. And that, that's been a huge um, help, but being present and being able to see it, I think, especially for families is, um, is a big deal. So um, those are, those are big wish lists right now. Great. We have one uh, question that just popped up um, about students walking onto your programs and how can it happen with the current issues? So let's start with uh, Kevin and, and just go around and, and just touch real quickly on, on what walk-ons walk look like right now. Yeah, um, I know for us, we, we're kind of capped at a certain number of, of players. We're capped at eight. So um, right now we have seven, one coming in the spring. So we're kind of capped for that. Um, if they wanted to maybe take a gap year and we're losing two players after um, this upcoming season. So maybe take a semester off or a full year off and then try to walk on that, that following year when we lose two players. So. Okay, Cammie, how about you? Uh, we typically go with more of a recruited walk-on uh, type position. Um, just because we do have a fairly large team for, uh, for a tennis program, for a women's tennis program. Uh, we currently have 10 athletes on our team. I think the highest I've ever gone at Sac State has been 11. Um, but we're always open to the possibility. I would say during this time, it's, it's just tough um, and it'll come down to some communication. So um, really, if, if people had inquiries about it, just, just get a hold of us, um, either myself or my assistant. Um, our information's on our website. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just all situational, um, but, but we definitely take a look at it. Yeah. Lori? Yeah, you know, we do it a few different ways, meaning we have recruited walk-ons. We have players that we'll pick up um, through that process. And then pretty much every year, with the exception of last year, we do tryouts for the campus community because we might be looking for 
you know, somebody to help us out in the bullpen, or we're looking for somebody with some speed, whatever kind of the need is for that year. So, you know, the best way right now to put yourself in line for that is you got to reach out to us. Um, email, I think is always the best and beyond, you know, some, some players are really, you know, being diligent about filming their training, sending it over, whether it's them working out, whether them doing agility drills or them hitting, taking grounders, whatever they can do, or former game highlight films, that kind of stuff are, are really important so I can get eyes on, on what that person does. But I think it's important to talk to each coach individually, um, whatever you know, team, whatever university you're looking at to find out what their needs are and if there is any spots available. Um, currently for us, we're, we're similar. And I feel like you're starting to see this, particularly in the sport of softball, where our roster sizes are getting larger and larger every year just demand and, you know, people wanting to play and, and opportunities um, that are out there, which is great. So we're at 26. So right now we're in a position where we're not looking to pick up any walk-ons, which is rare for us. Um, usually we might have an opening for one or two, um, but this year would be different, unfortunately. And it's, you know, for, I think as coaches, we're all kind of in that same boat where your heart breaks for that 2020 class, you know, who would look to walk on or even the 2021s that um, usually, you, you know, the coaches see you play on the field and, and they get that connection to you. So it's, it's been challenging for that, but you just got to keep reaching out to the coach and, and email them, email them, email them, and um, try to break through that way. Um, I think calling an office phone works too, but many people are working remotely right now. So email is going to be your best. Yeah. Jolie? Dance is completely different animal uh, as far as recruitment. Uh, once we establish our roster, we usually don't add to that unless there's a real, real need for it. So unfortunately, um, we don't take um, dancers throughout the semester. We push them to audition for the next year. But I wanted to echo what Reggie was saying about finances and everybody else. Um, because cheer and dance this year, although we are so fortunate to usually get operating budgets and whatnot, unfortunately, we did not get that this year. And that has put us in a really crucial bind. Um, I have a male dancer on the team for the first time. And um, we're, we need outfits and uniforms. And so this has been an increasingly difficult situation. Uh, but at the same time, um, we'll make it work. We always do. And um, I want to echo what the other coaches said about safety. We want to make sure that our, our students and our athletes are, are safe um, first and foremost. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Sure. Sorry I skipped over you on no, that. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, Mike, any word on walk-ons? Well, we're always looking. Uh, it's <laughs> It's our traditional way of uh, taking on walk-ons the beginning of fall and, you know, trying to integrate them into the team because we will teach anybody how to row, but it's a long process. So that's going to be tough this year. There's obviously very few <coughs> people on campus. And so we're still doing uh, some recruiting informational meetings next week by Zoom just to try to you know, collect interest. And then, um, I mean, even if somebody puts it off for a year or, or a semester, and that's the other thing is we don't typically take athletes um, in January, but this year we will. So, you know, um, we'll just have to find a way to sort of um, kind of blend them in over time, um, which which will be challenging. But in, in some of those kids that may maybe come out later in the second semester, they they might just end up redshirting this year in terms of racing, but that's okay. I mean, the important thing is is, is uh, getting involved and, and getting a taste for it and, and uh, see if it's something they want to do. So we just want to make sure that we can still provide that opportunity because, you know, our numbers are going to be lower this year because of all this stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an important element of our, of our sport. Um, you know, we need to, we need to have a large squad. <laughs> so. How about you, Reggie? You know, right now, right now we currently have, I think 38 or 39 players on our roster due to the, you know, just the you know, guys, guys coming back and, um, 
you know, it's, so it's already a challenge for us from, you know, coaching 30 or 38 guys is really, it's a lot of players to, to try to coach with four coaches. So traditionally we've had walk on tryouts uh, in the fall. Uh, I don't know what that's going to look like this year. You know, I would say this year from a pitching perspective, our pitch, we only have 12 healthy pitchers right now. So if there's a need in any one area, it would be on the pitching side. But again, what's that going to look like in terms of how much we can be with guys and, I just think there's so many uncertainties um, for me to not have a better answer for that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Ed, did I already ask you? Oh, uh, no. Okay. Was, um, yeah, the, um, our beach volleyball team currently relies heavily on our indoor volleyball team. So our roster is pretty much exclusively our indoor players. Um, and our indoor roster is also being our beach roster, we pretty much, uh, we rely on recruited walk-ons and are, we're kind of in a situation where we typically will solidify our rosters uh, pretty much an acad uh, of almost a full academic year in advance. So um, it's not unusual for, for us in volleyball to already have our 20, 2021 recruiting class already completed by now um, with with COVID-19 uh, going on and the recruiting uh, limitations that we have in place to, uh, for safety measures, um, that's kind of changed right now, but typically uh, that's kind of how, how it has worked in the past. Um, we still encourage people to contact us. Um, you know, there, there, things can change. There could be mid-year uh, changes that could have opportunities. So we encourage people to reach out to us, email us and, um, or even drop by the office and inquire and see if there's been any changes. Great. Okay, we have one last question and we'll kind of do it rapid fire maybe around the around the group. Um, Coach Christensen, you had said that you would have learned a lot more had you taken the opportunity to ask questions. Um, can all of you say, you know, how would you foster that with your team right now if they wanted to ask questions? What would that look like on your team? And we'll start I'll, with, with Yeah, Patrick. I mean, one thing that we've done throughout this whole time is we've, uh, you know, we tried to do the Zooms early on um, with myself just sitting in front of 35 guys, and that kind of got old, quite honestly. Um, mm -hmm. So what we did is we, we split our, our groups up into six or eight, and they would kind of just uh, Zoom or FaceTime with each other um, periodically during, the, during this break. And I would meet with six or eight guys via Zoom. To, uh, they'd come back with questions to me. Sometimes your student athletes are, are afraid to ask the question uh, to the head coach, especially when they're younger. So we've, pr I think, pr uh, promoted a, a pretty good situation where these guys can go to the older guys on the team, ask questions. Those guys can come to me without the fear of, you know, they all think that they're going to ask a bad question. There's real, really no bad questions. So I think just promoting and talking about it, telling them that you didn't have it figured out when you were 18 to 22 years. I mean, shoot, I'm almost 45 and I don't have it figured out. So um, just being vulnerable with your student athletes, I think is the best way to promote people asking questions and without the fear that they're going to be, you know, looked down upon. Yeah. Coach Jackson. Ed. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with Reggie. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, you just develop comfort with the athletes um, within the team uh, to where they they're just comfortable asking questions. Our roster is obviously a lot smaller. Um, you know, we only care about 16 athletes. So um, I, I we have a pretty good relationship with our athletes where they, I think they feel pretty comfortable communicating with us if they have any questions. And, and that's been going on. We have been doing uh, Zooms. We've had several Zooms and uh, we've been real quick to kind of try and keep our student athletes, you know, in the know and, and kind of have an understanding of, of how things are progressing and going on. Um, and then we also just make sure they understand that we're available anytime for any questions or anything like that. Um, we do have captains as well. So we have a kind of a hierarchy uh, sense where we have our student athletes that can ask questions to our captains and our captains can relay that information and they can to us. Uh, and they can also be liaisons 
uh, for us. So we kind of have that kind of, of um, camaraderie going on with our, our group of players. Great. Kevin? Um, for us, I think the same thing. Um, we do a lot of things with our captains. Um, if the players are unsure to talk to us about something, um, they'll communicate with the captains. If they can't get the answer from the captains, then captains will talk to us and then we'll personally, you know, talk to the athlete. Um, but yeah, I think, I think just being open to either Zoom call or actually just one-on-one -on -one calls. Um, we have a small roster, so it's, I think it's even more personable. It's like one or two athletes. Um, it's so much easier to kind of get your message across with one or two than to try to do groups for us and um, just taking the time to, you know, just see how things are going and ask questions. Are you guys okay? And um, those are the, those are the important things right now. Great. Lori? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the fostering of the environment is, is I think the biggest piece of it. And knowing that the, the practice time, the time when we're together, in that, you know, practice days or coaches days, game days or the players day to really put together what they've worked so hard on preparing. And we want, I, I want a million questions. And I try to really continually, you know, if I see two players talking about a play, I'll go, hey, and I'll walk over and hey, can I answer a question? And, and, and I love when our upperclassmen kind of take the reins and, and answer it because my goal is by the time they are upperclassmen, they know our system and they can answer some of those questions, um, particularly within practice or help guide our, our younger players in the right, in the right direction um, that we want in our program. But it, it's really just fostering that environment and, and asking questions. If I have a player that I know maybe wants to go into coaching, you know, I kind of zero in on them sometimes in practice and, and, you know, ask them about the drill and make sure they understand it or how would they teach it and stuff like that. So, and, and, and any critical real big questions, yeah, a lot of times it'll go through our leadership team and, and you know, um, to our assistant coaches, because like Reggie said, it, oftentimes they are nervous to ask the head coach. Um, they don't want to look like they don't know. And, and to be honest, in our program, we assume you kind of know nothing. And we know you know stuff, but we break it down. First day of practice, we're teaching you how to throw again. And I'm sure our upperclassmen sometimes are like, here we go. But, you know, they, they, they know it's coming. And I think they like the reminders. So um, it's, it's just, like I said, fostering that environment and knowing that there is no dumb question. I, I want to make sure you know. That's more important to me than me feeling like, oh, how does she not know this? That, that's, that's not important at all. Great. Jolie? Uh, my team leaders do a great job as seasoned veterans of being available for all the team members and the dancers. Um, we encourage them to start asking them first before they, you know, come to me with certain things. But I also make sure that I create an environment where they can always come to me, open door policy, because sometimes it's a personality thing and somebody might feel more comfortable coming directly to me for the little things like what are we wearing, all that kind of stuff for game. That is the responsibility of the team captains to make sure that's disseminated appropriately and they do a great job of that. But um, there isn't really anything in the last 17 years that has surprised me, you know, in private door conversations. And so I just, you know, as my fellow coaches know, we're, we're, we parent, we mentor, we're friends, we're all of the above. So um, just, we do try to encourage open communication at all times, you know, with the understanding of the hierarchy that's in place as well. Great, Cammie? Oh, I don't think I can really add anything else. It's, it comes down to communication and just making sure that you're there uh, for your team. I know our team has done a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff. We make sure that about once, well, during all this, we haven't seen our team since March. Um, so we've been doing once a month where we have a one-on-one -on -one as coaches with everyone. And then we're doing, trying to do once maybe twice um, a month where everyone's on the same call and then we break into little groups. Um, so we're just, we're really trying to communicate. We have, we have student athletes that are quite literally all around the world. So we've got all different time zones. We're trying to, to just get everyone on the same page and, and make sure that everyone's just living a good, healthy life and, and ready for school to start next week. Coach Connors, you can wrap it up. That's our last. <laughs> You know, um, it pretty much what everybody else said, but I, I guess one thing I discovered um, in this environment with Zoom early on was unless you want to sit there and talk the whole time, 
<laughs> without a lot of engagement, you have to uh, uh, find ways to sort of pull them into the conversation. So, or just invite them into the room, sort of. Um, it's weird, but, and even on committees that I've been on and stuff, it was, it's kind of sometimes the same net effect, but it's, uh, you know, maybe ask somebody specifically a question that's not even, that's not even on topic, like, you know, at the time, like, hey, how's, how are things were, because they were like, a lot of them had gone home, so I was like, well, how's it where you guys are at, or what have you guys heard, you know, and just, just get them talking about, you know, um, and then sometimes questions would come out of that or information would come out of that. And then people would sort of like, sort of, you know, chipping in, but it's, it's really easy on, on these things to, to just find out that you're the only one talking, which is not really the, the objective. So. Great. Thank you, everybody. I'll throw it back to Jennifer. Let her wrap things up. Absolutely. I want to share with everyone before I ask the coaches our last question of the day that uh, we want to encourage you to get involved. Consider joining the Alumni Association. We made a change in January that we no longer collect membership dues, so it is now free for everyone to be a member of the Alumni Association. So I've put a link in the chat. I hope you'll click and consider joining. And we also encourage you to visit hornetsports.com. Uh, learn more about the athletic fund, how you can give to support our student athletes, find the social media channels for the different teams, follow them, and hopefully someday in the near future when we're able to invite you to campus to watch competitions, we hope you'll be there to support our student athletes. So in closing, maybe in 10 words or less, uh, let's have each of you share the, your favorite thing about your sport. Lori, softball, go. Okay, here we go. Um, favorite thing about my sport is uh, it's a little, I don't want to say slower pace, but there's a game within the game. <clears throat> so what the fans are watching in the stands is happening in the, in the dugout as well. But there's a whole nother game within the game in terms of kind of playing chess when you're playing the game of softball and, and, and baseball. And so that inner game that's going on is my favorite part for sure. Since you said baseball, let's go to Reggie. What's your favorite thing? <laughs> Lori stole that. was a good one. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I just, you know, I guess I, uh, you know, growing up playing catch with your dad. Um, so it just, the game takes me back to that, you know. And so getting a chance to see these guys uh, chase their dream of playing in the big leagues. I was watching Reese Hoskin hit a, hit a home run about an hour ago on my phone. Um, just, just the relationships that they build together really I love all sports so I, it's hard for me to just say hey baseball is better than because I don't think it is I think baseball is unique um, but it's really just getting a chance to see these kids chase their dreams together and there's such a maturation process by the time they walk on our campus and when they walk off so that's that's what I love about baseball and any sport really. Well, selfish moment. I want to brag about uh, Reese Hoskins. We, the Alumni Association, will be honoring him with a Rising Star Award as part of our Distinguished Alumni Awards program on October 15th. Uh, so hopefully everyone will tune in for that. Uh, Jolie, how about you? Favorite thing about dance? The artistry and the energy between the, the dancers, both verbally and non-verbally. It's just that magical connection spiritually physically everything it's hard to put into words gives you goosebumps yeah cammy how about tennis you know tennis is a lifetime sport i think that's my absolute favorite thing about it anyone can play any age i know i've taught kids as young as three and adults as old as 75 uh in my in my coaching um outside of the collegiate realm and i yeah i, I think the best thing is that we can really relate to anyone, anyone can get out there and play and um, you get to see it on TV and it's just a really cool spectator sport. I like the concept of lifetime. Uh, Mike, how about you with rowing? Um, the, the symmetry of the sport in a, in a very coordinated fashion um, where you, there's no stars, you have to rely on the efforts of the whole versus the one. Um, sort of, within that is intense physical output and pain. <laughs> so you have these two sort of like juxtaposed 
things, you know, having to work in tandem. Well, no pain, no gain, as we've always heard. So, uh, Kevin, how about you mm -hmm. with tennis? Yeah, great, great stuff, Cami, about tennis is a lifetime sport. Um, I really um, resonate with that. It's a really awesome thing. And plus, too, um, you know, as the players keep getting older and older, you find them playing on uh, later in life and then teaching their kids. So it's a great cycle. But I think the, the neatest thing about tennis at Sac State for me is um, when we go on the court, um, we can compete with anybody in the nation. So it's um, – it's exciting, you know, when it's, you can win a match in singles, beat a nationally ranked player and instantly get a ranking, uh, or you could beat a nationally ranked team, team like Lori was talking about. And it's just, um, it's really exciting, really fun. So that's the night, most fun things about tennis. And last but not least, Ed, volleyball. Well, uh, uh, for beach volleyball, other than that we get to actually play at the beach and hang out at the beach, um, uh, the, one of the things that's kind of unique about our sport is the, uh, the partnership dynamic. Uh, it's, I've really enjoyed coaching, trying to, because we have five pairs uh, playing at one time, so we'll have five different groups playing at one time, and trying to find ways to put together the right uh, personality groupings with the, the pairings. Uh, that's something that I really enjoy about beach volleyball. All right. I have to do one more shameless plug for our Distinguished Alumni Awards program, and that's uh, an alum of Lori's program, and that's Alyssa Nakin, who is now a coach for the San Francisco Giants, and we will be honoring her on October 15th as well. So double the reasons, both of you in the same session, uh, to tune in, and we're so excited about that. Um, so as we say goodbye to everybody, we'd be remiss if we didn't do a stingers up. President Nelson would probably uh, strangle us. So everyone, Sac State is number one. Stingers up. Stingers up. Stingers up. Woo. stingers up. Thank you for all that you do to support our student athletes and Sacramento State. We're so proud to uh, be members of the Hornet family with you. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.